DBEC is supposed to be really difficult in eyes with tube shunts. And that's true. It is actually a really difficult operation under those circumstances, but not for the reason you might think. Lots of people assume the problem with DMEC and eyes with shunts is you can't pressurize the anterior chamber at the end of the operation. You can't use gas or air to keep the graft attached because all of that gas or air just goes up the tube shunt. So the graft is left unsupported, so you have these detachments. Um, that turns out not to be the case. Our detachment rate is just as low with eyes that have tube shunts as it is in any other eye, which is kind of curious, but it's definitely statistically true. The real problem is that these eyes are more surgically challenged to manage. And that's true regardless of where the tube is. It's true if the tube is in the anterior chamber and it's equally true if the tube is behind the iris in the posterior chamber. And I want to show you a classic example of just such a case. This is a patient that we operated on last week in our office. He was referred by a cornea specialist, a very good, talented doctor from far away. The patient had just had DSEC for corneal endothelial failure because of the tube shunt. And even though the operation went perfectly and was done by a wonderful surgeon, the graft detached in the immediate post-operative period, and so the patient is sent to us with the idea of trying to replace this detached DSEC graft with a DMEC. And this is the complete, full, unedited recording of the operation, and I want to walk you through the steps and the special considerations that go into this operation. We're doing the surgery as we always do under topical anesthesia in our office. That's supplemented with one cc of subtenon's liposomal bupivacaine. And we always emphasize the one cc component of that because we don't want to deliver some large volume of fluid behind the eye that pressurizes the globe that would contribute to anterior chamber instability. Here we're going to remove, first of all, the old DSAC graft from the eye. I'm using this long inverted Sinsky hook. You'll notice if you examine the tip of this thing, it's twice as long as the tips that you commonly see on an inverted Sinsky hook. And I love that feature. I really prefer these longer tips because you get so much better grasp and purchase. You're able to stretch out around the eye to circumnavigate the globe, so to speak without uh, really feeling like you have to stretch or strain because you have a longer tip. It just allows you to move around the eye more easily. And after we've removed the graft, what I'm doing now is I'm just going around trying to find unstripped little shred remnants of native decimase membrane so I can clear them completely before putting a new graft in the eye. And this is by far the longest part of the surgery. And I'm not going to edit it. I'm just going to let it play because I think it's important to watch all of these details. You know, philosophically, I believe it's good to do operations, um, not necessarily quickly, but I think not to dawdle. And there are lots of reasons for that. I mean, I, I think you don't want the patient on the operating room table for any longer than you have to have. But also, just the longer you muck around with an eye, the more of a chance you're going to have some kind of problem. It's better to focus and concentrate and be efficient. But I spend a long time stripping this decimase membrane because this is really important. If you have unstripped shreds of decimase membrane left in the eye, it can contribute to lots of problems. It can precipitate detachments. That's for sure. But, you know, it also just makes the eye look ugly after the operation. You know, when you do surgery on somebody, that patient is going to go see other eye doctors later in their life. They're going to move. They're going to have an optometrist. They're going to stop seeing you at some point. And you really want whoever looks at that patient's eye to say, wow, oh my gosh, beautiful. Not, you know, I'm surprised this eye can see so well considering how ugly it looks. You know, you want to leave the eye looking beautiful. Now you'll notice here I'm stripping 
initially with that inverted Sinsky hook and now with this Mela scraper through the main wound. And one thing that I want to call your attention to if you haven't already observed is how unstable the anterior chamber is. Okay, the chamber is constantly collapsing as I'm doing this. And it's not just because I'm using the main wound. It's here. Look, when I'm not in the eye, the bubble doesn't stretch all the way out to the limbus. See now here the bubble doesn't fill the entire anterior chamber. Why? Why is the bubble not going out all the way to the recesses of the angle? Okay, why does the bubble not want to stretch to fill the entire anterior? Look, right now, I have an anterior chamber maintainer going. Why does the bubble resist filling the anterior chamber? And the reason for that is the key to this whole operation. This is what makes the surgery difficult in a tube shunt eye. This is the key concept you have to understand. The problem with a tube shunt is that tube shunts destroy the zonules of an eye. And that's true whether the tube shunt is placed in the anterior chamber or as in this case, the tube is in the pars plana. It's, or excuse me, in the sulcus. It's behind the iris. Um, and I don't know why it is, why it would be the case, but it's definitely true that a tube causes zonular compromise. And the reason this chamber is unstable is because the air is going behind the pupil, around the lens, into the back of the eye. And in fact, if you'll look carefully, you'll notice actually you can see the menisci of these bubbles floating back behind the patient's IOL. That's why the chamber is unstable, is because there are air bubbles floating around behind the lens and the buoyancy of those air bubbles is lifting up on the lens. So you have a shallow anterior chamber when doing these eyes with tube shunts. That's the thing that makes them so difficult is that you have a shallow chamber that it's very difficult to deepen because the whole thing is being buoyed up by these bubbles behind the lens. And this can be very severe. I mean, sometimes you have massive zonular loss and, and, and even the whole IOL is tilting up. You can sometimes see the edge of the IOL coming up into focus through even a constricted pupil because it's being lifted up by all of these bubbles that sneak their way back there. So this is the key thing to keep in mind is eyes with tube shunts have shallow anterior chambers with misdirection of air or aqueous through missing zonules. Now what I'm doing now is I'm going around with coaxial forceps and I'm using the main wound and I'm using a variety of paracentesis to try to tactile feel around and engage little lingering strips of decimase membrane that I was unable to liberate using the inverted Sinsky hook or with the Mela scraper. And this is so important because they're often difficult to engage in any other way and you need to be able to remove them so they don't interfere with attachment and so they don't make the eye look ugly. And whenever I am replacing a DSEC with a DMEC, I always have these coaxial forceps on the tray because I know I'm going to use them. And you know, the other thing I'm doing is I'm stripping under air as I always do. And I like that for lots of reasons, including here now when I'm looking for these little tag shreds behind, you can see these little abnormalities on the back of the cornea, which are highlighted by the air. You have these little areas that stick out because the air bubble either exposes them or the air bubble is precluded into moving into those areas because these little shreds. So it makes it extremely easy for you to find these stragglers left behind and to differentiate them from the posterior stroma to make sure you're not mucking up a previous scar or prior paracentesis. So to be able to see them and remove them cleanly and completely, in my opinion, you need to use air as opposed to saline or viscoelastic. And you'll notice also I'm using the main wound predominantly when I'm using these forceps because these coaxial forceps, even small gauge, these are I think 23 gauge coaxial forceps. If you're leveraging through a paracentesis, it tends to stretch out the wound. And then when you are completed with the case, you have to suture the wound or you have to hydrate the wound and it just adds time and sort of adds 
a, a degree of inelegance. So I prefer to use the main wound um, uh, connected along, supported by this anterior chamber maintainer. And again, I mean, I, I've been doing this for six or seven minutes here at this part, and it's definitely the longest part of the case. And once I'm content that I removed all of the decimase membrane left behind, I replenish the lidocaine in the eye now. And um, you'll notice that the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make an inferior iridotomy. This patient already has an iridotomy. They already have a tube shunt, but I don't ever want to leave any of that to chance, so I make my own. So now I'm reloading the anterior chamber instead of with air, with saline. That's what this AC maintainer is connected to. It's with saline. And now I'm going to make my iridotomy using the Ertley Capsularexis handpiece. And watch what happens when I go into the eye with the Capsularexis handpiece. Here I am making a little iridotomy inferiorly. And look at all that air that comes up from behind the iris, from behind the pupil, behind the lens. Um, and that's way out peripherally. That's way out peripherally. So this, this air is coming from absent zonules. And there is often a diffuse zonulopathy. It's not just the few little strands in the vicinity of the tube shut. It's all over the place. It's this tube. The key offense it has is if it damages the endothelium, it is at least as bad for the zonules. So now what I've done is I've removed the air that I can get to. You can still see bubbles back there behind the lens, but I'm hydrating the wounds, I'm deepening the chamber, I'm making sure I have a stable anterior chamber. And I'm gonna inject the graft into the eye through this main temporal incision. I'm a little bit decentered on the screen, I'm sorry. The graft looks upside down to me according to this triangular notch I've got nasally. So I inject saline perpendicular to the lie of the graft and that flips it over. So now the graft has gone from upside down to right side up. And here we have this sort of vaguely, loosely double scrolled configuration. So this is me checking the Motsura sign and doing the help yourself technique just to poke the graft over into the angle. And you'll notice that the help yourself technique is not quite as useful in this case as it normally is. And that's because the chamber is so shallow. When you have a really shallow chamber like this, you push the graft over, but rather than separating the two edges of the graft, the whole graft tends to slide over together as one unit. So helping yourself is a little bit less useful than it normally is, but it's fine, it still works. And, and these are Dirazomer taps that I'm applying to open up this last little lingering edge of the graft. And you'll notice if you go back and watch that again in real time, uh, the key to getting this graft to unfold was making sure it was well centered in the eye. If you have the graft shoved over to one side, it's much more difficult to unfold the edges. So you really want the graft centered in the eye so you have plenty of room for all of these edges to come out. And here I'm just applying a few little shuffling bumps in the center of the cornea just to center the graft. And I'll lift it up to the back surface of the, cor of the cornea on an air bubble. And this is what the eye looks like at the end of the operation. I'm pressurizing the eye fairly firmly here because I'm not so worried about a pupillary block because not only does the patient have multiple iridotomies, but they also have a functional tube shunt. So this is the end of the operation with the eye pressurized firmly and we conclude the case. So I, I like showing this video. The reason I thought this video was worthy and worthwhile is because um, I've never heard anybody else talk about this difficulty with DMEC or DSEC for that matter in eyes with tube shunts. The issue, the concern is not is the graft going to attach? Yes, the graft attachment rate is the same as any eye with bull's keratopathy or any eye with Fuchs dystrophy. The problem is not attachment. The problem is the operation is more difficult because you have this intractably shallow anterior chamber because you have zonular loss with misdirection of air or fluid behind the lens. That's the first important thing to keep in mind. What do you do about that? Well, the first thing is to recognize that that's going to be a concern. You're going to have a shallow chamber. So I like to use slightly smaller grafts, which are easy to tumble over and flip around in case you've got a graft upside down. If you've got a giant graft and the chamber shallow, it's tough to work with. So I like to use slightly smaller grafts. I also like to use slightly younger tissue because younger tissue curls a little bit more tightly which means it's easier to flip around inside the eye if it's upside down. If you've got some loose, floppy sheet of Decimase membrane, it's much tougher to flip it inside the eye. So 
There are lots of times I prefer to use older donors. Here, I like to use a little bit younger donors, 60 or younger for DMEC and eyes with really shallow anterior chambers. If I had had real difficulty with this eye, then I would have done a vitrectomy during the operation to remove some of the air or aqueous which had gone behind the lens if I couldn't deepen the chamber in any other way. It's also, of course, important to make sure that you've got the chamber as stable as you can before you inject the graft. So you want to make sure you're not leaking from any of the incisions. Um, I think the last point I want to make is that this operation it was going to be challenging regardless of whether you did DSEC or DMEC because the same fundamental difficulty applies, the shallow chamber. Um, and if you have to battle that issue anyway, you might as well do DMEC because the patients heal faster, they get better vision, they have a lower steroid burden, so you're less likely to exacerbate the glaucoma. DMEC is just a better operation in every way. And if you're not going to get an easier operation by doing a DSEC, you might as well do a DMEC in the eye in the first place. So um, anyway, I hope this video was entertaining and interesting and informative to people watching. If there's anything I can do to help you do more complicated or challenging cases on your own, please let me know. If you're a resident interested in doing a fellowship with us or you're somebody who wants to do an observership, send me an email, call us up. We'd love to welcome you at any time. Thanks so much.